Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, deciding to spend your uh, evening with uh, us here at the Los Angeles Urban League. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the second course and our second quarter 2023 uh, webinar series. Um, my name is Kenneth Allen, and I'm one of the co-directors of the Entrepreneurship Center at the Los Angeles Urban League. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the Entrepreneurship Center, um, our group's role is to help businesses like yours accelerate your growth through both education, like this evening, providing you technical assistance and advice, and providing you with access to capital. If anyone on the call is not familiar with all of the opportunities and resources available to you through the Entrepreneurship Center, please visit um, our website, laul.org. That's losangelesurbanleague.org to learn more about our organization and about the Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, we can offer you a wide range of services and tools to supplement the knowledge that you acquire from these webinars. Um, and um, we have a wonderful group of talented business counselors, including our uh, host this evening, uh, who can also provide you with direct and specific advice and consulting directly to your business. Um, and as many of you may know, all of the services and advice that the Urban League provides is free of, free of charge. So uh, we really implore you to make full use of all the resources and access that the Urban League can offer. Um, importantly, if you're not already a member of the, of the Urban League or a client of the Entrepreneurship Center, uh, it would be very, very helpful if you could make sure that you register to do so. Uh, for people who are interested in doing that, um, my two colleagues who are also on this call can help get that arranged. Um, one, of our, my, one of my colleagues is Tai Umo. Tai, if you don't mind waving to the audience. Um, and uh, Daniel Leathers, uh, who are both uh, senior members of our team here at the Entrepreneurship Center. Um, Ty will put both the URL to get to the Urban League in the chat for everybody to see, as well as his email address. And Daniel will provide his in case any of you have any follow-up questions to ask of uh, our team or need guidance in terms of how to get to the different resources uh, that the Urban League can offer. Um, one other thing to mention before we dive into tonight's presentation, um, and this is uh, an example of the kind of resources the Urban League can make available to you. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, another California firm named California Beacons. And California Beacons actually provides uh, website design, digital strategy, and hosting services for small businesses websites. Um, and we are working with California Beacons to basically facilitate the creation of websites and hosting those websites for small businesses that are clients of the Entrepreneurship Center. So if anyone who is participating in the call would like to get more information about how you can uh, benefit from the program where you would again get design services from California Beacons and then the Urban League would cover the cost of hosting your website through California Beacons for a year. Um, let us know if you're interested in that. Again, please email Tai Umo or Daniel Leathers and we can follow up with you from there. So with respect to tonight's series, um, as many of you may know, this series is being sponsored by the Small Business Administration. Um, and the SBA had a really strong focus coming out of the COVID pandemic to make sure that small businesses that suffered disproportionately uh, as part of COVID uh, got the benefit of additional resources in terms of advice, access to capital, and um, understanding how to get ready for contracting and prepare to grow your firms. And so this program, as uh, many of you again may know, um, is the fifth series of workshops that we've had for small businesses. Um, they all follow a relatively similar pattern. Uh, we offer them five to seven uh, every Wednesday. Um, this is the second class in this series, and this series will continue through May 24th. Um, last week's class uh, was hosted by the CEO of California Beacons, a woman named Chacha McGinnis. Uh, today, we have a, a great presentation on product pricing. Um, and then the next series of classes will be a little bit more closely towards financing and understanding your financial profile of your business. 
So the next two courses will be offered by another one of the Urban League's business counselors, Crystal Mitchell. And then we're gonna finish uh, this quarter series with presentations uh, led by Chase Bank with respect to understanding your personal credit and how that can impact uh, your business credit. And then our last two courses are actually gonna be uh, hosted by bankers from PNC Bank. Uh, and they're gonna discuss with all of you the best ways to build relationships with banks, uh, as well as give you an overview of, a diff of the different products and services that banks can offer to firms like yourselves. So with that, um, I'd love to uh, dive into tonight's presentation, and I'm pleased to introduce our host for this evening, uh, Gloria June. Uh, Gloria works with small businesses needing financial guidance from someone who's effectively a CFO. Gloria transforms operations by developing and instituting robust financial processes and systems for her clients. Uh, and she can do that because she has expertise in industries ranging from retailing through professional services, as well as technology. Um, she comes from a family of entrepreneurs um, and has worked as a CFO for her family business. So she understands the challenges of both running a business, of kind of wearing many hats all at the same time. And she can, I think, give you expert advice in terms of all the things that are necessary for you to understand how to grow your business and how to manage your business's affairs. So with that, I'm pleased to turn over the call to Gloria. Hi, everyone. Okay, so thanks for being here tonight. And thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. I will share my slides. Where am I? And my sound. <laughs> share sound. Okay, so basically, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Gloria June. I'm not going to repeat everything Kid have talked about, but I am a fractional CFO. I work with small businesses and my focus is profitability. Okay, and in today's session, we are going to focus on the effectiveness of your pricing strategy. And keep in mind that depending upon your industry or maybe how long you have been in business, or in some cases, the unique contractual requirements of the contracts that you've entered, you will definitely approach pricing a little differently. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to ensure that whatever your pricing is, your volume, your profit, you want to make sure that your pricing will allow you to meet your monthly personal and business expenses and create your reserves. It's all about profitability, unless, of course, you are a nonprofit. Um, also, think about your goals. And I think everyone's goals look a little different. Some people don't need or maybe they don't care about money. Um, that's okay. But I'm sure many of us created businesses in order to build wealth. So you want to make sure your business model is sufficient to meet your annual business expenses or your retirement, um, your retirement savings. Having, having grown up in a family of entrepreneurs, I saw the uh, inconsistencies of the profits and the revenues and, and managing the overall business. Um, as an adult, when my husband decided to start his own business, I immediately jumped into action, you know, considering my finance background. And I wanted to make sure that he was able to continue to contribute to the household expenses from day one. And not only contribute to the household expenses, but also to ensure that he was able to um, contribute to his long-term 
retirement goals. And so what I'd like to do, if possible, I'd like to get a sense of the types of businesses that are represented in the call today. And so in the chat, I would really love to see if you could just quickly tell me what type of industry you represent. Bacon, pottery, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, hand crochet, wow, that's interesting. Property management, okay, writer. Beauty, lovely. Okay, good. And thank you everyone. So it sounds like we have nice representation today. But from a scale from one to 10, what is your confidence level in your pricing? Do you think your pricing actually works for you? Um, your pricing is structured in a way where you're able to be profitable? On a scale from one to 10, 10 being you believe it's super effective and one being not so much, I have some work to do. Okay, middle of the road. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. They're pushing it up. Okay, okay. Eight, I love that. Midway, but profitable. Okay, good. Thank you, thank you, everyone. So um, let me close this here. So in our presentation today, I am going to walk through Five important factors uh, regarding pricing. We'll start with the strategy and then we'll move on to price points and the cost of your products and product mix and so on and so forth. We basically want to take a holistic view of your pricing situation. It's not all about the price at the end of the day. So I would like to start with this quick video and let me know um, if you guys could- Someone recently told us our pricing is too high. As a small business owner who knows what it takes to create what we're selling, it can be a little disheartening to hear, but you know what? That's okay. One of the great things about having a business you created from dust is that you get to set your own pricing for what you're selling. We are not going to fit everyone's budget. However, that does not mean we're overpriced. We know what we bring to the table and our past clients can attest to that. Cheap service isn't great and great service isn't cheap. Those who see the value in what you are offering will pay what you are asking. You won't be for everyone and everyone won't be for you. And that's okay. Okay. And basically here, what she's saying is that not everyone is your Someone customer. recently told us. Not everyone's, not everyone's going to be a customer. So it's really important that you understand who your customer, who your customer is before you try to chase every single individual on this planet, because by doing so you're bound to fail, okay? And so the first question um, I typically focus on is asking the question, where should I set my pricing, okay? And the funny thing is that as we look at some of the issues people often focus on, in other words, what should I charge? What if I charge too little? And what if I charge too much? Basically, all these issues end up with similar implications. And that, I mean, you may have difficulty attracting customers. You may actually drive customers away. Um, people may be a little suspect about your quality. Um, one extreme example I have is when a young lady talked to me about creating resumes for her customers 
and charging them $25. And I said, you cannot do that because unless it's your sister and your cousin, who knows that you're a wonderful resume writer, <laughs> people are simply going to be a little wary about the product that you're offering them if you're basically giving away the product for $25, okay? And also from the perspective of the business owner, if you're pricing your product too low, it is going to result in poor or underperforming cash flow. And I think over the next few weeks, for example, Crystal is going to focus on cash flows and other financial um, important um, issues. So I think there will be a discussion with Crystal about cash flows. Um, and also, if you undercharge or you don't price effectively, it means that your bottom line is never going to be in a place that allows you to be profitable. And that has implications if you want a loan someday, because a banker wants to see that you have a solid profit and loss statement. And so what is your pricing objective? That's always an important question because depending upon your pricing objective, you will position your pricing a little differently. And your pricing objective needs to be very well thought out and intentional, okay? And so you need to ask yourself some very important questions as you go about setting your pricing. So for example, um, if your goal is to increase market share, um, this is an area, and I'm, I'm pretty sure many of the individuals who are in the call today are small business owners. And so it's very difficult for small businesses to com compete in a space where they're trying to gain substantial market share because you know, think about the Walmarts of the world and the target of the world. And if you're trying to compete with them to gain market share, it's just not going to, we know who's going to be the winner in that situation. Okay. Another of your, another of the pricing objectives is in regards to increasing profit. And as a small business owner, that is one of the areas that you need to focus on. Okay profit. Um, when we talk about recovering partial costs, often that's what people call loss leaders. So for example, when you think about a company like HP, where they make printers and they sell ink and toner, as you know, um, they often underprice the printers, they, they, they lose money on the printers, but it's okay because when they look at their portfolio of the products, having given away the printers, allow the customers to come back over and over and over again and purchase the expensive ink and toner products. And so that's where they make all their money. But again, that's very intentional, okay? Um, another pricing objective is quality leadership. And let's say you're a Gucci or a Prada or one of those types of organizations. Another pricing objective is aligning to your competitor pricing. This is, this is, um, this is an area that I believe is not a good idea. Because if you're simply trying to align to your competitors, you don't know and don't fully understand their business model. You don't know their cost structure. If you're trying to match what your competitor is matching, it's probably going to be an issue for you. And lastly, in surviving unmanageable, unmanageable situations, let's, let's, let's think about, um, a store with large levels of inventory, 
and that store may decide to discount the prices substantially simply to get rid of the, um, the excess inventory. But at the end of the day, when you decide what pricing objective you should pursue, you need to ensure you put it on paper. You say, for example, if I discount my price by 50%, how many units do I need to sell in order to cover my cost structure? That is pay my rent, pay my insurance, pay me. Does that make sense? Put it on paper, you have to be very intentional about the impact to your bottom line when you make those decisions. <clears throat> the next slide I would like to focus on is the types of pricing. Of course, there are numerous different types of pricing, but for the purposes of um, having just an hour and a half here today, um, I am highlighting three of the most popular ones, and the first one being cost-based pricing. And what do we mean by that is you're simply quantifying the cost of the product and you're adding a markup. So for example, if you're baking a cake and you know it costs $10 to bake that cake and you typically want to achieve a certain gross margin or markup, you decide what that markup is and you add it to the cost. And often this type of pricing may be required in, in governmental contracts. Um, the next one being um, value-based pricing, that's the, the middle option here. And basically this is where you understand what the customer is willing to pay, understand the customer's pain point. And this is where you will bring out your differentiation, bring out your special sauce. What is it that makes your product so unique? And what is the value, right? That you will bring to the customer and in that situation, there is less consideration to the cost, but you want to make sure that when you're meeting the customer's needs, you understand what value you're bringing to the customer, you're able to maximize your pricing. And in the third, the third bullet here is um, competition-based pricing, and again, this is one of the areas where you're simply following the leader. It's simply to implement. You may have little control over the pricing in that situation. And what is dangerous about it or concerning about it is you're doing it in spite of maybe your cost structure. You're positioning yourself in a way where you're not sure whether that price your matching will ensure that you're profitable. Okay. And so in terms of some of the popular pricing mistakes that are made by many businesses, um, and maybe for the individuals in the call today, when you look back, um, depending upon how long you've been in business, maybe in the chat, tell me some of the pricing mistakes that you've made when you first started your business. And hopefully you've learned from those mistakes and you've tried to avoid making them again. So if you could put that in the chat so everyone could see, and hopefully it could be a learning opportunity for everyone. Okay. And so some of the mistakes we see all the time is when businesses don't have a strategy and they don't, or even if they do have a strategy, they don't stick to it. It's not intentional. It's just haphazard. Or another type of pricing mistake that I see is when businesses underestimate the cost of their product or service. 
In other words, they're underestimating or, or just considering a fraction of their cost. And one thing I see over and over again is I will meet with business owners and I may ask the question, what is your gross margin? They will give me a number. And when we walk through it, I'll always walk through their assumptions with them. Nine out of 10 times, the answer is always very different. And that's simply because they've underestimated the cost. And another one of the pricing mistakes is when people compete only on price. And that goes back to um, an earlier slice, slide, right? And that slice <laughs> where you talk about the value you bring to your customer, making sure that the customer understands um, how your product will solve their pain so you don't focus a lot on the price, you focus on the value, okay? Differentiate yourself. And also check in, not checking the effectiveness. And again, that's where your financials and bookkeeping come into play. And I think Crystal will be um, presenting a, a bookkeeping session or some financials in the next few weeks. But at the end of the day, you need to check the effectiveness of what you're doing. You need to see the results of your pricing strategy to your bottom line. And if it's not working, this is where you need to revisit and decide whether you need to change your strategy. So in the chat, let me see, not charging enough, okay? No strategy, just working, not working on the cost. Okay, thank you everyone. Starting too low and going so high that I priced myself out, okay? No strategy, yep. Yep, thank you everyone, thank you. Okay, so in the next section, I would like to focus on price points, okay? We've just completed the strategy section and I would like to focus a little on the price points. And what is your, optimal price point. And one thing I always, one thing I know for sure is as small business owners, when we struggle with revenues, we think, we always think that the answer to the problem is to chase sales, right? Just bring them in, you know, fast and furious. Um, but very often we know that the answer doesn't necessarily lie with increasing the volume of the sales, but rather evaluating the price or the price point and also managing the cost. Um, while this may not happen all the time, we see that when small businesses pursue this, the strategy of just chasing down volume fast and furiously, what ends up happening is these small businesses end up undercharging versus overcharging for the products and services. And then as small business owners, when we're trying to chase a million bad sales, right, versus a reasonably a reasonable amount of sales that are priced correctly, we end up being exhausted all the time and you have nothing to show for it, all right? Just think about it. When you're underpricing yourself, you're trying to sell to everyone, you're exhausted because you can't keep up, okay? And effective pricing can determine whether your business survives or not. Sometimes you may need to experiment with the prices to determine the outcome of the bottom line. But careful, when I use the word experiment, you don't want to treat or confuse your customers like they're yo-yos, okay? You have to be very intentional. You say, okay, I'll test this for about six months. If it doesn't work, I may have to go back and revisit it. You do not want to be in a situation where every other week when a customer 
ends up um, comes into your store, the pricing is different and they're simply confused. After a while, you're not viewed in a trustworthy manner, right? So let's think about what if you could actually increase your revenues by having less sales, okay? Sometimes you may simply want to do the math and determine whether it makes sense for you to actually put a strategy like that into, into play. And so here's an, here's an example, right? Where we're looking at um, a company with different sales points. You could see at $100 price point, um, this company is expecting to sell 200 units at 122 price points, they're expecting to sell um, 170 units. But by the time they get to the higher price point of 182, this company will sell 123 units. When you look at the chart in the bottom, while you could see that the units have declined, in actuality, the revenues are higher, right? So with the 200 units, um, this company stands to make $20,000 in sales. However, with the 123 units, which is fine because we all know that not everyone's your customer. There are some customers who will say your product, your product is too expensive. And so that's why the demand will drop off. But in actuality, the revenues are higher. Okay. And so when you think about it in terms of optimizing, um, when you think about it and you're optimizing your price and the value, you could see in just a tabular format that at the different price points, let's say $100 versus $122 versus $149, and 148, the revenues are actually higher while the volume declines. But also in the fourth column, it shows you the amount of effort that you have to put to make this um, possible. So you can see you're putting less hours into selling those units, but your revenues are even higher. And later, you know, as a profit strategist, I, I often have to remind people sometimes so that it's not all about the revenue, it's about the profits. So, you know, with the hours required, that means you're working less, your revenue is higher. So maybe in this situation, you're more profitable. Okay. And so as I move on, I just want to touch very briefly um, on our current economic situation. We all know there is an extreme amount of concern about this issue regarding inflation. Um, what I'd like to know in your business, maybe in the chat, has anyone not seen an increase in the cost of the, the production of their products? And if you have seen an increase in producing your product and services in the last year or so, I would like to know, did you increase your prices? Okay, increase, yep. Yep, and also let me know what did you do about it? Did you also increase your prices or did you absorb the burden of it all? Okay, thank you. Okay, good. And just a, a, another quick comment. 
for the people who have been waiting in anticipation of maybe <laughs> a normalization of inflation before they increase um, prices, you can see every year since 1940, inflation, inflation is positive, right? There has been very few situations, for instance, I've highlighted 1950 and maybe 2009, where we've actually um, experienced deflation. And so, um, barring a few very specific examples with energy, we know that the price increases that we've seen in the last year or so well, well, it will continue, but you know, at a certain point, it's, it's going to normalize, but it's not going to go down. And so, in order to ensure that you're able to maintain your profit or even become profitable, you really should be evaluating your gross margin before, before all the price in, before all the uh, cost of production increased and afterwards because we all know that for the businesses who do not adapt in this period of rising inflation inflation will um will suffer at the end of the day you simply need to be transparent with your customers um i think everyone understands that um they cannot go into a store and expect that the prices will remain the same as they were in 2019, because in that situation, the only one who will lose will be you, the business owner. Okay, and basically in regards to, in regards to your, your price points, one thing I want to um, just highlight is, as you think about where you should set your pricing, you need to be very deliberate about it because it's hard to uh, make regular and constant changes to your pricing. You don't want to confuse your, um, your customers. And also we need to focus on prioritizing the value you bring to your customers instead of trying to be a Walmart or Target, because as small business owners, it's really hard to compete when you're just constantly trying to push the volume out, you will, you'll be exhausted all the time, okay? And also with the recent, um, with the recent cost spikes, you know, related to inflation, we know that those, spikes will have an impact to our margins. And so it's really important that you be transparent to your customers and make the appropriate adjustments to your pricing so that you will be profitable. Okay. And I will take a quick look at the chat just to see. Yep. Thank you. I increase each membership. Yep but your call, colleagues are concerned, okay? I found you vendors, excellent, excellent. Yeah, hard to increase because supplies increase, yeah, okay. Okay, so we're talking, about, so the last couple of minutes we talked about price points, but you really have to think holistically um, as when you operate your business, it's not only about the pricing, but it's also what about the cost of producing that product and also the mix impact, okay? Um, sometimes, very often, uh, and I cannot count the number of times it happens when I'm asked a question, can I lower my price or can I increase my prices or can I pay a social media promoter more? And my answer is, unless I don't review your financials, unless I don't understand your cost structure, it's really hard 
for me to really give you an answer because it's holistic. And so what I'd like to focus on in the next couple minutes is the cost of producing your product and service, okay? And so my questions, uh, my next question is, do you know the profit margins for the individual products of your business? Yes, no, some of the products, most of the products. And I will tell you, many businesses do not. They set prices without necessarily understanding the profit margins for their products. And that is of the utmost importance. And an another question I get all the time, what is a good gross margin? And of course, that is a very difficult question <laughs> for me to ask. Then I have a million follow-up questions, you know, because it depends. Because your rates will vary by industry or maybe by product or maybe by region or where you are in the life cycle of the product. For example, we know that in the software industry, um, the margins are super high, right? Because there's a lot of R&D that goes into um, software. So that becomes part of the operating expenses. Or when we think about restaurants, the restaurant margins are often super low. You know, I have a perfect example. Um, it was probably two weeks ago where I was having a discussion with one of the clients at the Urban League, and she was doing an analysis about her forecast and the revenues that she was anticipating that her business would generate in the next two years. And she had some incredible margins, right? They were just absolutely incredible. And we all know that restaurant owners, that's one area that restaurant, restaurants really struggle with. And her margins, should I say her gross margin, her, her net profit was something up to 50%. And this brought up a nice discussion between us as to how did she go about arriving at these assumptions around the margins, because this was a real forecast because it was a newer restaurant. It was not an older restaurant that had been in existence. And this is where I had to encourage her to pull some industry reports and do some interviews with other people to find out what margins are you seeing in, you know, in the, in, in the restaurant industry, for example, you cannot compare a restaurant to, let's say, a professional services business or a software company. And so you have to be very careful, number one, for first ensuring that you know how to calculate your gross margin and also doing the research to ensure that you are within industry um, standards. And more importantly, when we talk about margins, there are different types of margins. There could be gross margin and operating margins or even net profit. So there's a lot of discussion that's necessary when you're dealing with a business owner. And I will take a quick Service, okay. Can I have that talk then now? Okay. And when, so at a minimum, when you say you don't know how to quantify your gross margin, or I don't know if you're saying you don't know what the right gross margin is, at the end of the day, 
whatever that margin that you're able to um, generate from your business, it needs to allow you to have a positive operating profit, right? It needs to be positive. And so as we move on, I just want to take a quick view of a profit and loss statement, just to highlight the difference between gross profit and operating profit, okay? Because too often I hear people say, I made a million dollars, so I made $2 million, and the CFO in me goes crazy, like, you made a million, you made two million, what do you mean? Is that revenue? Is that gross profit? Is that operating profit? What do you mean? And so when we look at a typical profit and loss statement, and of course, Crystal will go through um, some examples with you a little bit more, we always start with the revenue. And in this situation, this business has revenues of 684. And from that, they subtract cost of sales. And the cost of sales is the direct cost of producing the revenue. And so if this is a bakery and the bakery has sales of 684, the cost of sales basically represents the butter and the sugar and you know the labor that goes into making the cake. All of that is considered direct cost. You subtract that from the revenue and that produces gross profit of 112. And the gross profit, or people often call it gross margin percentage, also is the gross profit divided by the revenue. And in this situation, it's 16%. Now, keep in mind, I don't know if this is a good gross profit or bad gross profit because I don't know what industry, right? We have to figure out what industry, what region, but we all know if a business has gross profit after subtracting the direct cost of 112, but operating expenses of 183, it means that the business is operating at a loss. So you could see a negative 71. So that's a bad thing. At a minimum, when you start with your sales, you subtract the direct cost of producing that product and services. The gross profit should always be sufficient to cover the operating expenses, or we call it indirect cost, Examples of that, and we'll talk about that a little later, would be the rent on your building, the insurance that you pay, your virtual assistant, um, marketing, all of that. It's important, but it's categorized a little differently. Okay. And this is where I have to focus a lot on ensuring that every one of you track your expenses. You have access, for example, to QuickBooks or Honey. There's so many um, inexpensive financial software tools that you could utilize in your business. If you're not at the point where you could afford that, you could use Wave. Wave is a free online um, software that allows you to track your finances. Um, that is so important because without that level of detail, that is the operating expenses, you will never know where your whether your pricing is adequate. And that leads me to the next slide. So remember, we talked about direct costs versus indirect costs. And direct cost has a strong correlation to the volume of sales, okay? So direct labor. So for example, if we're thinking about um, a, a business that um, uh, makes soap, 
right? So the direct labor would be the employees who actually mix the ingredients to make the soap. Direct material would be stuff as the fragrances, the, sh the shea butter, the castor oil. Um, you'd also consider, let's say, supplies. Let's say that would include the packaging materials for um, the sales. Whereas indirect costs are the costs that applies to, um, they're often, I would say, they apply to more than one business activity. And this is where the marketing comes into play, the rent, the insurance, and those types of activities. And again, I'm just reiterating, let's say this is a gross margin calculation. And let's assume this is a product that is priced at $100 with a direct cost of $40. The gross profit in that situation is 60. It's just a subtraction and the gross margin percentage is 60%. So with that $60, the idea is you will use it to pay the rent and insurance and all these indirect expenses, okay? And so we all know that businesses will never meet their full potential if they do not manage the gross margin calculation at a product level. You cannot do that only for a fraction of the products in your business. You need to do it for all, all the products in your business. And I have to say that there are times where I speak to businesses because they are not in the habit of actually doing these gross margin calculations on a regular basis. They end up in situations where the pricing of their product it's not even high enough to cover the direct costs, much less cover the rent on the building or their insurance. And that is just so heartbreaking. And so my next question to you is, how often do you evaluate the direct cost of the products or services in your business? And I must stress, not in your head, I mean, like pulling out a piece of paper, because I know many business owners are super smart and they often do a lot of this type of analysis in their head, but that's not adequate because when you keep that type of analysis in your head, you tend to underestimate and discount many of the important costs that you need to take into, um, into consideration, okay? And so I will play a quick video and just listen a little closely for me, okay? All right, let's do a little exercise. I wanna ask you, how much would you charge for this cake? I've listed here all of the ingredients and how much they cost. So the total ingredient cost is $44.34. And the most important ingredient is time, so we can't forget that this took me 3.75 hours from consulting, planning, baking, decorating, making the fillings, etc. We also don't want to forget overhead, so utilities, rent, website fee, marketing, accounting, any of those fees that don't directly relate to this cake, but that are still required for the business. And lastly, do not forget profit. You must make a profit so that you can buy new equipment, you can go to new training, you can pay yourself for a sick day, maybe you want to expand your business at some point, launching a new product requires some float. You must have a profit if you're going to have a business. So that's all the information I'm going to give you. Let me hear it. What would you charge for this cake? I personally have a spreadsheet that I use as a calculator. I input. Okay, so what I, what I love about this video is it's incredible it's incredible. All right, let's do a little exercise. I want to ask you, how much would you charge for this cake? Yeah, it's incredible the level of detail this person goes into to calculate the cost of a cake, right? Oil and butter and sugar and eggs and vanilla, flour, baking salt, 
there's just so much detail. And the danger is if you don't go through that level of detail and you keep it in your head, I could guarantee that there is a substantial amount of details that is excluded from your calculation. Notice in this situation, she's accounting for cling wrap and the label and the cake box. Or look at here. Um, remember we talked about not only should you consider the direct cost of the direct cost of um, creating that cake or that 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 soap or whatever it is, there is also an indirect component like the overhead in your business, such as utilities and marketing and uh, whatever you pay to your bookkeeper or your tax accountant or your marketing. There's just so much, and so I encourage you to reflect all this information in Excel or on a piece of paper because you will miss a lot of important. All right, let's do the this. Okay. And so here I did, and again, I know um, I'm not a baker. <laughs> I'm not a baker. So I did a quick analysis here just so you could see, you know, when you're thinking about a product, a physical product versus a service, okay? And we all know that, especially if we've not done that in the past, it will never be perfect upfront, but I think over time, you will get better and better and better at it, okay? Doesn't need to be perfect because Every time you do it, what I would say, if we're thinking about the wedding cake, I would say to you, when you're making your next cupcake or when you're making your next um, wedding cake, have a piece of paper next to you. And as you add the ingredients to that pot, you know, you keep track of it. So at the end of the day, you have a pretty good understanding as to what it's gonna cost you. So in this situation, you can see we have direct materials for a wedding cake, eggs, butter, flour, sour cream. And as you saw on the other slide, I, I don't have time or space to do this here. Um, so I've limited, I've limited um, the ingredients I've, I've, I've included here, but from a direct labor perspective, I think we have a tendency not to include our time, especially for small business owners where you're doing most of the work. You always need to take into consideration that as your business grows, you will be um, hiring someone to do the work on your behalf because you will have too many wedding cakes. <laughs> and so, as you figure out your pricing, you need to account for not only your time or whether it's gonna be someone that you hire, but it's important to consider seven hours, not just the time of the assistant, but yourself. And what if for some reason um, you have, you, you regularly rent a kitchen, right? Many small business owners rent a kitchen. So you want to take that into consideration, or is there a packet? Is there packaging you need to account for? So all these items you want to take into consideration. Write it down. Don't keep it in your head. That's the only way you will get better at this. And remember, this is just the direct cost. So when you price your product. Not only do you want to account in this situation, the direct cost for the wedding cake is 358. We will have to also account for the fact that you have to pay for insurance or you have to pay for marketing and all these other indirect expenses will have to be accounted for when you decide what that pricing needs to be. Now, let's think about a services example. 
This is an executive training event where you may have to buy, you may have to purchase some binders for the participants of the training event, or you may have an assessment you want them to complete before the event starts. Or you may also have to um, account for your time, the time of the contractors who are also going to assist you. And let's assume you may even have to rent a hotel space for the day. And maybe you may have to provide snacks to the participants of that training day. You may have to give them pencils in order to complete an exercise or even coffee, okay? Basically, you want to account for all those important aspects of um, understanding the cost, okay? And so when we think about your direct cost, you know, think about production efficiency. You really, number one, want to map out situations where you're able to be as efficient as possible in your production. So it means that, okay, if you have five cakes to make in a particular week, you know, try to line it up, line it up in a way where if you have to rent a kitchen space, you're not renting the space every day for a week. Could you consolidate for two days? And so that lowers your cost of the kitchen rental, um, making sure you're optimizing the labor costs of the individuals who work with you. Um, I often work. I often work with small business owners, especially those who may um, be in situations where they um, bake products, and they will say to me, "Well, I go to Ralph's, right? I go to Ralph's, and you know, I go to Costco." But you really want to make sure, right, it, you find ways of researching and investigating how you could go to downtown LA and, you know, create relationships with wholesalers to keep your costs down. And even with the cost that you have today, you should always be thinking regularly of renegotiating these costs looking for other vendors. And I think I noticed someone in the chat had called that out a little um, earlier today. Find new vendors on a regular basis because that's gonna keep your cost down. I will take a quick look at the um, chat to see if, mm -hmm, I would say yes for each product, okay, yep. Yeah. Yes, so Laura, every single item that you make in your business, you should know what it costs you to make it, right? Because in other words, if you're assigning a price to a product, every product that you price in your business, you need to know what it costs to make it, right? And again, it's all about the pricing of apparel on demand. But again, it all has to do with volume discounts and how you price it. And if customers are willing to pay excessive amounts for the apparel um, so you could get it to them quickly, these are things that you would take into consideration when you determine your pricing. Okay, I got kicked out, okay. Okay, and so I want to go to the next section and this has to do with individual product analysis. And that goes back to one of the questions someone said, do I do that for every product in my portfolio? Yes, because often, some of you may have a bookkeeper and you receive a profit and loss statement for the bookkeeper and you may be satisfied at a high level. Um, you may be satisfied with the 
consolidated gross margin. But what's a little challenging about that is when you've consolidated a bunch of products into a profit and loss statement, you could be missing some very important messaging if you don't know what each and every product is from a gross margin or a pricing perspective, okay? And so let's go to the next slide. Oh, so let's look at this video. Hey Costco, your rotisserie chickens are only $5. That's correct, and we lose $40 million a year selling these. You lose money selling these on purpose? Yeah, but there's a secret reason behind it. Do tell. Have you ever wondered why we put the rotisserie chickens at the very back of the store? To give me some exercise to burn those calories before I pound this down? Nah, it's because we want to get you in the store and then you're going to walk past all of our high margin product. These rotisserie chickens are actually considered a loss leader for us. Because we know when you buy your chicken, you got to buy your barbecue sauce, your chips, your drinks. And before you know it, your shopping cart is full of other items. This is super interesting learning about loss leaders. Could you do a part two? You betcha. Follow me here on TikTok for part two of Costco's loss leaders. Hey, Costco. Okay. And so that's you know, for, for a large part of my career, I worked in the printer, ink, toner industry, and that concept of lost leaders, where I, I think I mentioned it before, where we basically almost gave away the printers because we knew that we would make up we would make up the difference on the ink and the toner that the customer would come back and buy month after month after month after month. But the most important thing I need to say is that was very intentional. Okay? It was very intentional. It didn't just happen. Okay, It didn't just happen. And so as an example, what I want to do here is say this is a this is a business with an average gross margin of 16%. So you may say to yourself, this is a business owner who says, okay, with the gross margin of 16%, I'm able to cover the cost of my admin and my marketing and my insurance and you know, those other expenses. So I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I, you know, I'm fine. But the big factor that's been overlooked is within the portfolio, let's assume with this business owner, there's five major products, right? Five major products. And when the business owner decides hey, I'm going to do the analysis because I'm very interested to know that while my gross margin, my consolidated gross margin is 16%, I want to see in this situation, what is the tart contributing to, to the 16% and the muffins and the croissants and the mini pie and the Danish. And so the size of the bubble in, in this example also is an indication of the volume. So in my, in my example here, um, there are 860 units, which represents almost 36% of the mix of the units that are being sold in that business. It's being sold at a loss of 23%. And also we have another 900, another 198 units, which represents 8% of the mix of that um, business is being sold at a loss of 13%, whereas 56% of the mix of the units for that business is being sold at an average gross margin of 42%. So these three products here, 
are driving a favorable gross margin. It's great, 42%, but, oops, sorry. But, unfortunately, we have the Danish, which is being sold at a loss, and the mini pie, which is being sold at a loss for 13%. And so as a business owner, you then owe, your, you then owe it to yourself to do the evaluation to determine if I decide, if this is not intentional, if this is not a loss leader, such as the chicken from Costco, <laughs> where they're deliberately underpricing the chicken to make sure right? You're able to walk through the vacuum cleaners and you're able to walk through the toilet paper. You're picking up a whole bunch of products before you reach the chicken. So most people are not going to Costco only for the chicken. Maybe they think they are, but from the time they enter the store, they're picking up so many supplies before they walk all the way to the back of the store and they pick up the chicken. So Costco has made it its money on the toilet paper, on, I don't know, what else? The vacuum cleaner and all those other fun things. So by the time the person purchases the chicken, it's okay because they've shopped enough in order to make up the overall margin. But in this situation, this has happened because someone was not doing the math Someone did not, should I say, when the pricing had been done in the past, they had not done the analysis to see that two of their products, basically 44% of the mix, right? The Danish and the mini buy, 44% of the mix was being priced at a loss. So then the question is, what if, Let's say, so here's a, a circular, you know, this business is selling 2,400, let's say 2,418 units. So we talked about the mini pie being sold at a loss of 13% or the Danish is being sold at a loss of 23%. And so the question becomes, is the business owner able to drive the demand um, of these consumers, if the if the business owner says, I am no longer going to sell the mini pie or the Danish, I'm no longer going to do this because it's 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 not beneficial to me in this particular situation. And so what if because let's say Danish and muffins are so similar. What if they're able to drive the demand of the customers who typically bought Danish to muffins, right? And let's say mini pies, this is a situation where those individuals who purchased mini pies would say, I, I, I don't want croissants, I don't want tarts, I don't want muffins, right? I'm done. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes do the math and decide if a customer decides I'm going to walk away because you are not providing me with the product that I need. Okay. You may say it's okay. And in this situation, the business owner is able to drive the Danish purchases to muffins and completely lose all the mini pie purchases. So you could see initially we sold 2,400 units, but now we're selling 2,200 units. And again, don't be too worried about that because sometimes in spite of the fact that you're not chasing volume, as we talked about before, your profit could be more beneficial. And so when you look in this space here, where we initially had 2,400 units, right? 2,400, 2,418 units, we're consolidating both the Danish and the muffins into muffins. And notice we have zero Danish 
zero mini pies, and so our volumes different. So 24, 18, fewer volume, 22, 20. But look at the revenues. Our revenues are actually lower. Our revenues went from 684 to 586. But don't threat because now what has happened is we're seeing that the average gross margin of 16% is now 40%. So you will have to do the math in order to understand why that is the case that your revenue is lower because, hey, you're no longer selling, you, you, you know, you're no longer accommodating the customers who purchase the mini pies from you. But now everyone who's purchasing from you you're actually able to sell at a positive gross margin. And so we're going from 112 to 240. So that's a win for the business owner. And in this, in the next situation, what I'm showing is after you've refined the product mix, right? We've eliminated the Danish. We've also eliminated the mini, the mini pie. We're, ref we're saying we are going to increase our prices by 5%. When we increase our prices, we know that we're going to, in many cases, we know we're actually going to lose customers. And sometimes, we owe it to ourselves to do the analysis and understand the results of that. Because in the example before, if you remember the units, we went from 2418 to 2220. But now we're even further down where the volume is concerned. So the volume continues to go down. You could see the revenue, our starting point of 684 is now 613. But again, the margin continues to increase. We've gone from 16% gross margin to 43% gross margin. Okay? Owe it to yourself to put it on paper and evaluate. And as I'm saying, owe it to yourself to put it on paper. There are people like myself who work with clients at the Urban League. We're available to help you to do this analysis because I do know it's a lot. So this is a further, uh, another example where I'm saying this here is based on cost improvements. So what if we're able to improve our cost by say 5%. And so of course the revenue remains the same, the volume remains the same, but again, the gross margin continues to climb. So this is where you're working with different vendors, you're trying to improve, um, you're trying to improve um, how you do business, you're evaluating your ingredients, um, you're evaluating if there are any substitutes, but you're able to keep your quality consistent. You owe it to yourself to do this analysis on paper. And so in summary, this is an example of the actions we took in order to improve the margin to an average of 40, 47%. We started with 16%. We improved the mix where we eliminated the, was it the Danish and the mini pies? So we were able to get the margin up to 40. On top of that, we reflected a 5% um, price increase. And lastly, we said, just accounting for a 5% improvement in our cost 
look how we've been able to make a dramatic difference to our bottom line. Because like I say, over and over again, sometimes it's not all about the revenue, it's about your profit. Okay, so at the end of the day, I want to reiterate, number one, you need to know the gross margin for 100% of the products in your business. You should not be setting a price for a product if you don't know what it costs. Um, item number two, limit low margin products. So for instance, as in the Costco example, um, they're forcing you to walk all the way to the back to buy that chicken, but that chicken represents a small percentage, a very small percentage of the products they sell. Or like HP, we would closely monitor how many printers we put out there on the market because we wanted to make sure we were selling a lot more ink and a lot more toner. It was all a nice balance, but we always put it on paper, did the math to see what it what made sense. And benchmarks, okay? Benchmarks. You need to know um, what to strive for. You shouldn't be unrealistic. If you're in a restaurant industry, you may have to do some research, interview other um, business counterparts to see you know, what the average margins are or where they're purchasing specific products from just to make sure um, <clears throat> what you're driving for is realistic. And lastly, um, if the market could bear it, consider a price increase in order to help your margins, okay? And so, in the very last section, we are going to talk about the operating expenses, and that's the indirect cost we talked about before. And in the interest of time, I see it's 6.30. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but remember when we talked a little earlier today, we said it's a holistic approach. So number one, you need to consider how you're pricing your products. Number two, you have to be very careful about the cost, the direct cost of what you do, right? And number three, you have to make sure at the end of the day, the indirect cost, right, is reasonable in your business and the margins that you receive from your, you know, the sales of your products, the margins are sufficient to cover your operating expenses. And um, one important thing to focus on where operating expenses are or indirect expenses, often a lot of it is fixed. And so you have to be very careful that sometimes when you have a downturn in your business, if you're not selling as many muffins or you're not selling as much professional services contracts, it means that you're still on the hook for paying, let's say the payroll or maybe the equipment or the rent or the utilities. So it has to be a nice, mix between, let's say, the variable type indirect expenses versus the fixed expenses. And it goes without saying, back in March of 2020, or was it in April of 2020, when many businesses saw a substantial decline in their revenues because so many businesses had such large fixed expenses and insufficient reserves in their business, they went belly up, okay? And so um, don't get too 
um, <laughs> worried about this, but this is a typical profit and loss statement where, as you can see, I'm reflecting the revenue, I'm reflecting the gross profit of 112 and the gross profit percentage of 16. And remember, we talked about operating expenses of 183, which unfortunately is too high relative to the gross profit. And so that business had a loss of 71. And so this is where, as the owner of the business, what you will have to do, if you're in that situation, you will have to evaluate every item using your bookkeeping report to understand how you could lower some of those expenses. So you could see, for example, marketing, we're spending $50, which represents 7% of the revenues. So your question is, is this within industry standards? Should I be spending 7% of my revenues on marketing? Is that too high? So again, that has to do with industry standards. You may have to do some evaluation, speak to your business counterparts and see if that's reasonable. Also, what I love to do when, when what I love to instruct my business owners to do when they have their business report, always look at the year over year growth. So in this situation, marketing is reflecting a growth year over year of 178%, right? And so you have to ask yourself, what am I doing in marketing that's causing me to, to reflect such a substantial increase year over year? So what I'm simply trying to say is you really have to use your profit and loss statements, dive in, evaluate each item, make sure, right, what's shown here is reasonable and whether there's an opportunity, right? An opportunity to, re to reduce some of those operating expense line items. And so let's go to the next slide. And basically, what I generally suggest to many business owners is in order to <laughs> expedite the process of reducing their operating expenses, they should go through the process of evaluating the return on investment, right? So you're spending, say, $50 on marketing. In this situation, you want to see what what exactly what exactly am I getting for this fifty dollars? Am I spending it on PR campaigns and digital ads and trade shows? And how many customers were, was I you know was I able to increase my customer base as a result of the amount of money I spent in marketing? Or let's say travel. I traveled to some, I don't know, some convention. Was I able to pick up business or was it just all a great old party, right? Was it a, or for rent, I'm spending 21. Do I have to, do I have to set up shop in that fancy building? Is there an opportunity maybe in the long term to find another location because we know rent is pretty fixed, right? <laughs> In the short run, is there an opportunity once that lease ends for me to relocate to an area where I'm not stuck spending so much in rent? So in other words, you have to ask yourself, what do I get for all my spending in marketing, in travel, in all these fancy areas, could I eliminate it? Or if I can't eliminate it, can I reduce it, right? Or in a situation where, let's talk about utilities and um, utilities, you may say for Wi-Fi, um, you call Spectrum and you say, what? 
could I get a package that allows me to get a little more, but yet I spend a little less. Don't let it escape you. You will be surprised when I look at a profit and loss statement with business owners and I download the data, they see that, oh, wow, I have multiple Zoom. They'll say, I have multiple Zoom subscriptions. I, I didn't even realize that. Or I have all these reoccurring subscriptions that I don't even utilize. And we go, let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. And it actually makes a big difference. Okay. Don't let that escape you. And again, where operating expenses are concerned, be very intentional as to how you spend your money. Don't simply hand your credit cards to your administrative staff without supervising how and when they spend. You know, be very careful about um, all these trade shows that, you know, make sure before you um, make a decision to attend some of these conventions or trade shows that they have a history where you've actually been able to see a substantial difference to your customer base or to the knowledge you're able to utilize in your business. More importantly, you need to evaluate your spend each and every month. Evaluate your spend. You know, it's not enough for you to receive a bookkeeping report from your bookkeeper and do nothing with it. You actually have to use the data. And more importantly, create metrics, right? And by metrics, I mean, you will say where operating expenses are concerned, um, in a particular year, I do not want to spend more than 25% of my revenue on operating expenses, or I don't want to spend more than 20% of my revenues on overall operating expenses. And if you're managing to that budget you and you're evaluating on a monthly basis, you will be in a position where you could quickly identify potential issues. And in the last slide, what I'm, what I'm highlighting is, as you know, when we started the process tonight, we talked about revenues of 684 with gross margins of 112, and remember operating expenses of 183. And after we did the analysis where this particular business owner, because of the margins for the muffins and uh, the tarts, the, the, the mini pies, we eliminated some of those. We also imposed a 5% price increase. We did some work with our vendors and so on and so forth. And we saw a 5% improvement in our cost. What happened is you could see the revenues actually declined because number one, the volume went down a little bit and that's okay. We, remember, sometimes it's not all about the revenue, okay? But our profit, right? Our gross profit went up to 288, went from 16% gross margin to 47% gross margin. And then we looked at the, or what you will do rather, you will look at all the operating expenses in your business and you will try to determine what changes and cuts you need to make. You know, whether you would say, do I really have to spend the 50K on marketing? Maybe there are some areas within that marketing budget, I have not seen a substantial return for, so I'm going to not spend in that particular area of marketing. Or travel, I'll take it from eight to five. Remember, every month you will be evaluating your spending. You will be eliminating these 
subscriptions that you never use. But at the end of the day, because of the work that you're doing, you will see that your operating expenses go down in this situation to 167. And as a reminder, because your gross profits are higher, 288, and your operating profits are lower, you're actually reflecting a profit. Okay, so this is the type of work you need to do on a regular basis, right? You need to actively manage your finances on in your business to make sure that you are profitable. And so in conclusion, what I want to make sure is that you're very intentional about your pricing. Your pricing is not haphazard. Doesn't happen to you. Instead, you are the one, you've done the work, you've done the analysis and you set your price correctly. Don't necessarily gravitate towards the lower price. Remember, as small business owners, we're not Walmart, we're not Costco. We don't wanna compete at that space because we will fail. And you need to know the cost of sales and the gross margin for every product in your portfolio. And lastly, remember where your operating expenses are concerned, that's your indirect expenses. You should be reviewing your indirect expenses on a regular basis. And let me take a quick look, 15 minutes left. Okay, yep, Danielle, budgeting makes a huge difference. Yep. Yep, so um, let me know if anyone has specific questions. I know in every everyone comes from a different industry. You have different types of products. So it's sometimes it's really hard to generalize. But I think Ken and Ty mentioned that if you are not a current client of the Urban League, um, I think they will, again, reiterate how you could connect with us and we will help you and guide you in making some of those, those decisions, okay? And so um, we'll send you some slides, but some of the things that I would like you to consider, um, you know, I have this ribbon in front of, I have a ribbon in front of the, my slides here, so I can't even see, but I think this says, um, do you know the gross margin of 100% of the products or services that you offer? So you have to start there, right? So you need to know the direct cost and the price create a list, okay? Often, often, also talk about how often do you discount your products and do you track your sales? What is the volume of the units you sold last year? Sometimes you may need to do um, an analysis to say, okay, how sensitive are my clients to a price increase? What if I do 5%? What if I do a 10%? Um, what will be the impact? And again, bookkeeping systems, you have to, right? Whether it be free, whether it be paid, I mentioned if you don't have access to our popular QuickBooks subscription, there is Wave, which you know gives you limited access to a profit and loss statement, but it's still very valuable, right? And also um, just making sure you keep your eyes on your operating expenses. You dedicate at least a day a week where you 
check your finances, right? And see where you are relative to your budget, okay? Thank you, okay. Yep, yes, Carolyn, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Daniel has reflected the registration link in the chat. So if you would like to meet with me directly or any one of the advisors for the Urban League, you can. So thank you, Daniel. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we will send you the slides by tomorrow for sure. Yeah, can I watch this again? Yes, Laura. And Laura, I think you and I have a date in another couple of weeks, so. <laughs> okay, so um, it's 6.50. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks everyone. Any questions? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is Ken Allen again. Um, just to uh, follow up, if um, as Gloria mentioned, if you are interested in getting copies of the slides, uh, please send an email to that effect to Daniel Leathers. Um, and I think he shared his email in the chat uh, at the beginning of our session this evening. If uh, you'd like to get a copy of the recording, uh, also send an email to Daniel and we can make sure that uh, you get that information. Uh, if you are not currently a client, um, it, you will need to register as a client um, to get that information. So, and again, I think that link is actually at the very, very top of the chat. Um, so with that, unless um, anyone has any further questions, I want to thank Gloria for a great presentation. Um, I, I think people often underestimate the importance of uh, the information that Gloria shared. So I'm very happy that uh, so many of you were able to stay on this evening and kind of hear all of that uh, great insight that Gloria had to offer. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all again next week um, when the conversation will shift a little bit from revenues and uh, clients and focus more on uh, managing your books and understanding how to control your cash flows and internal accounting. Thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great night. And thank you again, Gloria. Great job. <laughs>